My name is Chris Noe. I'm the owner of The Leverage. We're a fashion house located out in Orange County. What we are is a vertical fashion house from manufacturing, distribution, sales, logistics, all the way to marketing and customer service. We own about, I think roughly like nine in-house brands. Welcome to The Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of Thank you for coming on today. I appreciate this. What does it yeah. mean to be Vietnamese to you nowadays? Being Vietnamese is something to have very, very big uh, th- uh, resilience and thick skin. Just because, like I said, I mean, I told the story over and over uh, by myself and my family too. Because, you know, we're, we're considered the refugees, uh, refugees and the boat people. So, you know, we've seen, we've seen some shit happen, you know. And being Vietnamese, you know there we, we don't come from generational wealth not a lot of us a majority of us is coming here with whatever we whatever our family got or picked up and got picked up and left with so the majority of us came over here with absolutely nothing with just a shirt on our back so i would say being Vietnamese is being resilient you know that's a perfect lead in to the question i ask all the time thematically is we know and we've gone through this whole tough experience of being poor and not coming from general generational wealth how do you kind of rectify this drive and ambition and instill it within your children because they're deprived of an opportunity to kind of force them you know becoming into diamonds the way we the pressure and all of that how Mm -hmm. do you ensure your next generation pushes harder than you despite not having the challenge of poverty I think the biggest thing you need to do with children, especially myself, I have a 10 year old, an eight year old and a five year old is talk to talk to them at an early age, like human beings, you know, not like they're kids. So like um, I spend a lot of time with my kids. I coach them in basketball. I'm always I'm with them all the time. But for me, every chance I get in a conversation in car rides is I tell them stories about how it was when I grew up, you know, so it was just like, you know, you guys are very, very fortunate. You know, you're able to play basketball. You're able to have nice shoes. You're able to eat where you want, um, go on vacations because dad and mom sacrificed. I mean, especially dad, you know, we came from, you know, living in Santa Ana in a bad area, being on welfare, you know, government assistance. My mom was a seamstress and she was like a, a seamstress working at a factory, uh, getting paid per item that she made. So it was very, very difficult. I told, I tell them stories and I paint a picture them letting them know that you know what they do right now is fortunate and i'd say i'd say the same thing it's like you know dad is going to provide you with everything you need now but i'm not going to hand it over to you you got to work hard you know you're very fortunate you know you're not going to ever have to worry about you know what's gonna uh, like what clothes you're gonna wear you know what food that your parents come home to eat or if your parents are going to make the rent it's just different so the biggest thing, like I said, is just to talk to them. You know, the only way is like storytelling. Like think about history, the history books and everything too. How is history preserved um, down the line from generation to generation to generation from somebody telling a story? And so that's what I do. I tell them stories about situations when I was their age, when I, you know, when I was a kid and the things that I wasn't able to do. You know, I just, I, I tell them everything. You know, like, you know, you playing basketball now, Dad couldn't play in a basketball team because he couldn't afford it. You know, you have multiple basketball shoes. Dad had one shoe all year long. Dad played basketball outdoors. You know, you guys get to play video games. Dad didn't have video games. You know, so so that's that's how I kind of pushed him too. And you know, I try to you know teach him as much as I possibly can about the future. Um, you know, my kids, especially my daughter and my my oldest son, they come into my office every single day. Um, and they see what I do. They see that, you know, I run multiple businesses. I have this big, um, um, I say big platform in fashion. And I tell them the same thing. All I wish for you to do is look at what dad did. Um, you know, if you're able to learn from this and take dad's knowledge or dad's, you know, network, um, build your own thing. And that's what I want them to do. So, you know, I, I want them to follow my footsteps and, you know, build something on their own. But... All that being said, I know there's pros and cons to both how you and I grew up and then how they grew up. Do you, can you point out the difference in what you're saying? You're like storytelling, you know, you think it'll affect them. 
But if you compare your drive currently to the trajectory of where they're going, mm -hmm. I know it's different. I know there's pros and cons, but do yeah. you see where the difference is in their drive? And I ask you because I have younger children, I have a four and a five year old. I, I'm, I want to learn that mm -hmm. is there a way that we can not push, but instill ambition in our own way of success, uh, derived from success. But oh, it, it's, I feel it's easy. Um, it's not, it's not much the talking. It's pretty much like leading by example. So the way I am is I'm, I'm super OCD in everything I do. Um, I'm always fucking punctual, like not even punctual. I'm always on time. Um, I'm, I'm up early. I make it a big deal to always show up, whether you're sick or hungover or whatever it is, you got to just show up every single day and everything I do, I really kind of go over OD, you know, we, we spoke last time about me running a marathon. Well, I did the marathon, you know, um, now I'm training for an Ironman. And so my kids see me out there every single morning at, up, uh, up at 5 a.m. in the morning, either swimming, biking, running. I've, I've done an hour and a half, two hours of cardio, um, to an hour and a half, two hours of cardio before most people are even awake. Um, and they see that too. And they know after that, I go into work. I work full time, run multiple businesses, manage multiple people. And then what do I do after that? I come home, get them together, and I run a basketball program, which I coach and it's their program. And, you know, by the time I, by the time I'm done with that every single day, when I get home and eat dinner, it's already seven o'clock. So, I'm already, I've already been up over, over 14 hours before I get to even like relax and chill. There's no, there's no time for me to relax. And they see that too. And I tell them the same thing. I'm like, look at the way dad works. Look at the, everything that dad does. Dad does this because I'm trying to teach you and sell to you how, what hard work looks like and, and it looks like. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to ever sugarcoat every, everything, but I push them the same exact way. I have them playing basketball five times a week with a coach. Um, you know, and he pushes the shit out of them. And why is because, because, you know, they have the opportunity to. So, you know, my whole thing is, my whole thing's always been lead by example. Yeah. You know, all my employees said the same exact thing. I just got back from two different trade shows. Um, I was able to go to a trade show, fly home, coach my kids basketball team, you know, spend the weekend with my family, fly back to Vegas to do another trade show, come home on time to coach the basketball team, you know? So for me, for me, there's no excuses to be lazy. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, very yeah. inspirational for me to, to hear that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been around denim and these manufacturers for, for a while. I've uh, had a good friend yeah. in Hudson for, for a few years and AG it's history and production to me is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, what, made you take a gamble in the denim space and why denim and not other you know knits or you know whatever why why denim I, i'll be honest with you um when me and my business partner lee uh we started uh started in the fashion industry we were sales reps i'm on my 20th year as a, a in the industry i started when i was 22 years old i'm going to be 42 this year um so for us we were sales reps and we were repping just a bunch of different brands and different items and uh, when we started our own sales agency we wanted to be able to sell a product that people wore year round. And so the one item that people wore, no matter how hot, how cold, what city, whatever was denim, you know, a t-shirt. Yeah. People wore t-shirts year round, but like during the summer, during the winter, not many people are buying t-shirts, you know, in some areas like, you know, some areas like Wyoming and like these cold, cold areas, you're not buying a t-shirt year round. I'm not going to focus on jackets because jackets is a seasonal item. When was the last time somebody in California yeah. bought a jacket? And so for us, we're just like, man, if we can get really good at, if we can get a good denim brand to sell, we'll be able to have business all year long, just like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And so when me and my business partner started the leverage in 2012, uh, one of our first brands was this brand called Rustic Dime. And it was just the low cost denim brand out in LA, but we were just selling the shit out of it because it was low cost and people were buying it. And so for us, once we saw you know, once we saw that, we realized, I was like, dang, this is what it was. And then we had a lot of success selling denim brands. But at the same time, me and my business partner had this knowledge of fashion since, you know, you know, we live, we live, breathe fashion, you know, been in it forever. But we, we were giving these brands ideas, washes, concepts. And so one day, me and my business partner said, hey, you know, I think it's time for us to start our own, uh, our own brand. And so, you know, 
We went overseas, found a factory, and the rest is history. Now, speaking of overseas, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of cost of production in the U.S. and factories and managing labor here is out of control. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, very difficult. What do you think it's where we're headed with manufacturing in America? So, you know, for America, I think America manufacturing, especially in the apparel industry, it's gone. It's not going to happen. Um, just the way just the way the prices are, wages and everything, too. Um, you know, back when back when I was a kid, five, six years old, my mom, you know, she worked at the factories um, out, in, out here in Westminster. There was a ton of them. If you're a Vietnamese, your mom either was a seamstress or did something in manufacturing. It's, yeah. It was normal. Um, but, you know, as prices went up, people started going overseas to China. And at the end of the day, you know, um, the only brands that you're able to buy anything over here uh, to manufacture over here is if you want to do luxury. You know, if you want to buy, if you want to be able to buy a, if, you, if you're okay with buying a two, like a two, three hundred dollar pair of jeans or a jacket for four or five hundred dollars, you know, it's going to be made in the United States. But, you know, everything else, almost every other brand you're talking about your Nikes, your Adidas your Zara's and into your, uh, your high end brands like Alexander Wang, um, shoot some of the, some of the stuff in uh, a majority of the stuff from essentials, you know, everybody in my industry, you know, we manufacture overseas so we could be able to make margin and sell it to people in the United States. So yeah, the, um, the manufacturing industry I see in the United States is pretty much gone. So you don't do any manufacturing in America anymore. Everything's overseas. Yeah, I mean, we do a little bit of printing of T-shirts, uh, which is uh, over here, which which isn't terrible. But, you know, the blanks and every set, all the blanks that we buy are, are blanks that are made from overseas. The only thing we're doing is the finishing and the printing here in the United States. Now, this uh, idea of taking your product to shows uh, across the country like Magic and these uh, fashion shows, you know, and selling them retail to stores versus online is, are those days gone? Cause I know the transition is here I'm, or it's been, I'm, here. I'm, you know, that's, that's a little, that's a little tough. It's, it's just a different market, you know, before, before the TikTok IG online days with DTC, the only way you can get your brand out to anybody is to go to trade shows to get to stores. Yeah. Um, I'm old school. I'm very old school. That's how, I built my business. The reason why I think I'm successful is because I have something that no one else is willing to do, which is customer based B2B. And so all my years of working, you know, I thank God we've built a rapport with, you know, 700 to 1000 plus retailers worldwide, where, you know, we're able to launch a brand and get it in front of so many different buyers. But you know, this day and age, you can start a brand, um, you can start a brand and just be able to buy Facebook ads, buy TikTok ads, uh, get an influencer, you know, shoot content, put it on a rapper, put it on a celebrity, and you're able to sell it, you know, uh, uh, directly consumer without never, never once selling it to one host, uh, uh, wholesale store at all. Where'd you get your drive from? Being poor. I mean, honestly, being poor. I mean, I, like, you know, let's, let's be frank here. I grew up in the, I grew, I was born in the eighties, grew up in the nineties in Santa Ana and Westminster area. My mom, my mom was a seamstress, broke. My dad, you know, didn't have much money either. I think our total income together of both of them was barely three thousand dollars for two people, but we made it work. But you know, for me, it was just growing up. You know, I got in trouble and stuff like that, shoplifting and doing stupid shit. But you know, I I told myself I was like, you know, the only way I'm gonna ever be able to do anything or want anything is I have to work for it. So you know, at a young age, I didn't want to shoplift or you know steal that much and do them shit all the time so i was like i got to figure out a legit way to do stuff so i started started doing what i do best which is called buy low so high i started flipping rims flipping shoes um flipping car parts i mean shit i was selling anything and everything you know so for me you know it's always been the nature of the beast of the beast i mean my first job out of college was a loan officer and so within my first three months as a loan officer, I was your top producer. So that was just always my drive. I was like, either you're going to be broke and want shit or you're going to, you know, put your head down, shut the fuck up and go get it. You know, so that was my thing was just go get it. I, you know, I say this, I say this all the time. It's like I was I was in love with the lifestyle I couldn't afford, but I wanted to afford it. So I went for it. You know, but a lot of people come up poor and a lot of people want lifestyle, but they 
like there's got to be this magic moment where it clicked in your mind where it's like no more shoplifting no more like living that way of life and i'm gonna put my because a lot of people grow up poor a lot of people continue mm. to shoplift a lot of people continue to go into the life of crime or whatever yeah. where where is it where is that monumental moment that happened in your life where you're like okay i'm gonna now go for this and i'm not gonna look back yeah i, I mean I, it's two monumental moments you know my father was a military dad super strict so i was scared shitless of him he'd beat my ass if i ever did dumb shit so me going in for me going into gangs and doing all the other shit, that wasn't going to happen. He was going to beat my ass. I was, more, I was probably more scared of my dad than any person in the fucking world. Let's just be for real. But, I mean, at the same time, for me, it was like, thank God that he was that strict because he gave me two options. He's like, I right, well, you can't gang, you can't hang out with all those other kids. You get two options. You go to school and you can play basketball. That, you know, and so, you know, that was my love of basketball because that was the only other thing I could do without, without hanging out. And so, you know, that was like, that was, that was the, the good part of having, having a strict dad. But for me, the monumental moment, I think is when I, I just lost my job in the, uh, just lost my job in the mortgage industry. Um, the whole company laid me off and laid off a bunch of people and I was just chilling on unemployment. And then one of my buddies, um, one of my buddies invited me to the trade show of uh, magic in 2004, I believe 2003, 2004. And I was just there strictly just to hang out, help him out at the trade show. It was his second trade show. The the one he did prior, he didn't really do that well. Um, and yeah, I was just there just shooting the shit and doing what I do. Um, met met a couple people outside at the trade show. And, you know, you know, lo and behold, talked to somebody, talked to somebody. And we were, you know, chit-chatting over a pair of Nike Air, a Nike Dunk, uh, the Tiffany Dunks. Guy was cool and guys like oh what do you do i'm like oh this is my buddy's brand i'm helping out he looked at the brand and he was just like you know what i'll put it in my store i have about 15 stores and so he lit, ended up buying about at the time he looks at the collection he's like let me get a let me get a five ten ten five which means five uh five small ten mediums ten large and five extra large across the board means every single SKU you have and so as i tallied up the order it came out to like fifteen thousand dollars and i was like oh shit, that's dope I, I didn't know anything of it. My buddy was like, hey, man, I appreciate you doing this. He was like, I'll give you 10% of this. I was like, you can give me 1500 bucks to just this? And he was like, yeah, whatever you sell here and whatever you sell here, I'll give you 10%. So I was like, holy shit. Okay. So I sat there at the show. I think I wrote something like, I want to say I wrote something like fifty five or $60,000 uh, at the show. The previous show, you didn't even write anything. And so I made $5,000 that weekend, you know, uh, that four days. I'm just sitting there selling stuff. And he was like, hey, listen, dude, after you collect these orders and the ships, I'll give you a commission. But all the other business cards that you collected, um, just go ahead and follow up with them. And that was the magical moment. I mean, I did exactly what I did in the mortgage industry. I was a tele you know, I was cold calling. So I put it into an Excel spreadsheet. I got my headset from my <laughs> From my from my room from the uh, from me being a telemarketer, and I said, "All right, well, we're staying on the phone." And so that first season, um, after following up, I did 150k in sales uh, for him. I made fifteen thousand dollars, twenty two years old, selling fucking t shirts and hoodies. And so I was like, "All right, this is what I'm gonna do." Holy shit! What a great story. Yeah, great origin story though, right there. Mm -hmm. And then, how did you get better at the business? I know we all know that you know the more time you put into something, but a lot of people put time into shit and doesn't it doesn't doesn't pan out. How do you think strategically you figured out how to roll this out and then grow as big as you have? I think the thing is for us, for me myself, is I have this problem with like getting really really OCD. Like everyone knows, once I get into a hobby, I go all out. I'll study the shit out of it. You know, like whether it's basketball, uh, Iron Man collecting guns or basketball cards or whatever I'd be getting into, I get really, really like over compulsive about everything. And I learned everything about it and I try to break it down. And so for me over the years is that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be able to say that, you know, I have a piece of the whole uh, supply chain. And so for us, you know, we already have the distro, you know, we're sales reps, all right, cool. We're selling. Now we're not no longer selling the brands. We own the brand. Okay. Well, now we don't use a 3PL company. We have our own 3PL company. We have our own customer service. We hire our own marketing. You know, you're looking at my photo studio here. Um, instead of outsourcing, uh, outsourcing for uh, photo shoots to other photographers, I'll hire a photographer and build my own photo studio. Um, 
down to the fact that you know building building out um, building out logistics overseas in China. Now we're partnered up with the factories overseas, and we have our own sample team out there. You know, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, if you look at the pie, there's a hundred percent of a pie, right? There's a hundred percent of the pie. If you're doing sales, uh, if you're doing sales and you have to pay somebody else, now the pie gets smaller, right? And so, for me, I looked at the pie as a hundred percent, and how much can I take of this pie? And so it shrunk from like I have ten percent of the pie, I have twenty percent of the pie, I have thirty percent of the pie, I have forty percent of the pie, I have fifty percent of the pie. Right now, I feel as if I have about almost seventy-five to eighty percent of the pie. The only thing that I don't own is the actual, the physical employees and all the factory overseas and the cotton and the material that I bought. So you know, so that's how I kind of look at everything. Man, that vertical integration is so important. Yep. Yeah, it's how we control our costs, but then. There's a risk side to that, right? When you're vertically integrated and you have to support this whole structure. Mm -hmm. What happens when, like, I think we're facing a market downturn right now, right? We are. And how do you mitigate the risk and, and the dangers of being under finance and undercapitalized for that? I mean, the thing about us is that we've actually been very lean uh, on our business. How many people we have. We easily could have way more people here, um, way more way more warehouse guys, way more customer service. Um, but the thing is, thank God that, you know, we have, uh, we have nine different brands. You know, if we had one brand and it fell off, then I'd be in a shit show. You know, yeah. like there's seasons and months that this one brand does better than another. And then that that's a thing. And me not being tied into just one brand, more or less like as a fashion house and a back end vertical structure, I can start a new brand at any time. I look at what the market is, what the market is buying. I look at what the buyers buy. I go to trade shows. I try to find out, you know, what is it that I can make or what is it that my uh, my company can make to better ourselves or get a little bit more of the market share. So, you know, from starting with denim, then starting with starting with denim, then starting with t-shirts, then wovens. We got into accessories. We started making juniors. We started making kids. We got into, uh, this year we're getting into athletics. And so, you know, it's um, it's just the nature of the beast for us. It's just trying to fight, figure out like how to progress and what else we can do better to make the distribution of the team around me, you know, more money. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Having all those things covered and you know running lean seems to be a very uh, safe approach. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think it, it it's hard to talk about the life of an entrepreneur or anybody who's like a really high achieving person without the physical and the mental component that we have to stay in shape, eat well and all that. Like when in your journey did you start to figure like that's an important component in success? Um, I think when I started taking my uh, my physical appearance um, pretty much seriously, when I started my company was, was like 2000. I mean, I got married in 2011. I started my company in 2012. So, you know, obviously during that time I've always been I'm, you know, I've always been in decent shape, but but like right before my wedding, I was probably the chubbiest and the fattest I've ever been. And so I got in really, really good shape right before the wedding. And I started my company. And then for, for me, it was that drive I got by waking up early and getting a workout. And so once I started doing that, I mean, before I'd never work out in the morning. One time I started working out in the morning, it just changed my whole mood and my, my, uh, my feeling. So, so when I started working out in the morning, I went from my, I was wired. I was wired after my workout and I go straight into the work. And I'm like, dude, I feel great. And after I, I did that since 2012 to now, 2012 uh, 12 to now, you're talking about 10 years. And so I've made that my thing is just waking up early, getting my workout in and just checking off all the boxes because, you know, I, I think it's just for me overall, it's just a, it's just a, a good wake up call. And I mean, it just sets your mood. And that's the reason why I think it's, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, if you if you watch all these interviews with entrepreneurs like yourself, these successful dudes, it's all like that. Women, men, they mm -hmm. all hit the gym super early. They eat right, and then they function. That that drive and that that mindset allows them to go much further than the average person. Yep, and believe this or not, though, so, you know, since I've been doing this, that thirty minutes or hour or whatever of cardio that you're doing, and now now it's crazy because I don't, uh, I've been training for the Ironman and, um, you're not allowed to have musical devices on you. So I'm running and doing everything with no music, no nothing. Right. But it's kind of, kind of crazy. I'm running like six miles and you're just talking to yourself in your head. And so for me, 
I'm using that, I'm using that hour of me running outside and just kind of picturing my days and just kind of describing things I need to do or how I want to approach projects and everything too. And it's, it's kind of, it's kind of wild. Like a lot of people are like, what you train with no music? How the hell are you out there? It, Crazy. Like but some of my why, friends that did it before said the same thing. It's awesome. But why don't they let you do the electronics? None of I mean, them. None, none of the iron. Because marathon, Ironman. you can put on. You can strap yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, marathon. You did. I ran the. I ran the last marathon. Uh, I ran the last uh, half marathon like two weeks ago, just to get prep for this. And I didn't. I didn't listen to music either. Oh, just wow. getting ready. Yeah, I've been. I've been training straight, like what it would be like to be an Ironman. I mean, it's one of those things. I'm like, you know, if you're going to do an Iron Man, there's going to be some rules. I, it's it's kind of gangster. <laughs> it is super gangster. It, yeah. It, but it, and it almost sounds like now that um, I think about it, it's almost medita meditative to not have mm. all that stuff because you're allowing yeah. your brain to kind of like wander in this free space where you can really think and process where you, otherwise you wouldn't have that time to kind of like be with yourself, right? I mean, you're talking about being out there running for that long. You start listening to like, birds and like car noises and stuff like that it's 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 soothing uh, i'm not gonna lie it's actually really really soothing it, it's a different experience but for the half marathon did you wear music wow oh you just yeah. said no yeah oh yeah i just gotta get used i just gotta get used to this that's amazing man and how did you come up with the name leverage for for the company uh man it honestly Honestly, the, the wild thing is I just wrote down a bunch a bunch of item a bunch of names. I don't know how I came up with the leverage to be honest. But then I read it up in the thesaurus and it said something about being able to use your power, your power, uh, your power and your uh, network to influence others. And I was just like, eh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, we have re we have relationships with all these stores where we're able to leverage our relationships to get all of our brands into the store. And so I was like, eh, it's, it sounds dope. And what about leveraging anything within country in Vietnam? Because a lot of manufacturing comes out of there. Mm -hmm. Have you dipped your toes into going to Vietnam to make things? The crazy thing is this. I'm I'm so, um, how do you say this? I, I wouldn't say I'm old or against it. I know there's a lot of money in Vietnam and Vietnam has changed dramatically. Uh, it's just that my dad was a high ranking official over there in Vietnam when he came here. He's not, he, he told me he was on like a blacklist. He couldn't go back to Vietnam. And, you know, my mom and my dad passed a couple of years back. And for me, it's just like out of respect to them. I haven't, I have enough, I have enough where I'm, where I'm at right now for me to go back there and them knowing that I went back to Vietnam and did all that business and, you know, in the communist country and stuff like that. It's, it's just more or less morals for me. So that's the reason why I've never even considered it. Wait, so have you been to Vietnam? No, I've been to Vietnam. I'm, I've been to Vietnam. I've been to Vietnam multiple times. But you won't do work. I won't do any business in Vietnam. Do you think that will ever change? Uh, I I can't say no, you know. But as of right now, for me, unless unless a shit show happens in China and China completely closes down and there's no business for me to do there, and my network, uh, you know, literally thins out, um, it probably wouldn't happen unless that happened. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to make this conversation uncomfortable because you know, yeah. dipping into the political realm. But I do. I'm curious about because there's a lot of people like you who yeah. adamantly feel like I'm not touching Vietnam because it's still under a certain sort of government form that you you know that was harmful to the previous mm -hmm. generation. You know, yeah, but yeah, yeah. at some point, um, I'm just curious. Like, what do, what would it take to shift that thinking in you? I don't honestly I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't be a it might not be me, but if my kids, you know, if my kids ever did it, I I wouldn't have an issue because, you know, at their generation, it, you know, at their generation, it's gonna be almost two generations over. You know, the people they're doing business with had no, you know, had no recollection a recollection of what happened over like in, in 1975, you know. So so for me, I'm still a part of that first generation that came here. Um, but if my kids ever did it later on. I probably wouldn't have an issue with it. Yeah. So you're, you pretty, you're locked into a long game saying I'm committing mm -hmm. to not convert over to any <laughs> shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I bring that up because a lot of my dialogue with our guests, you know, it ranges from people like you to people like, you know, my brother who's been there for 20 years, you know, he yeah, does. Yeah. No, I mean, the thing is like, I mean, I have a lot of friends that do a lot of business over there and I have a lot of friends that, are killing it over there. You know, I have friends that are directors, manufacturers, um, 
a music producer. Uh, they own nightclubs and stuff, and it's great. I would love to visit. You know, I would love to visit. I would love to support them that way. But for me to be like, hey, this is a hub that I'm working out of. This is uh, where I'm. I'm going to be setting money or my business. You know, that's that's another that's another thing. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, we all have our uh, beliefs, yeah. and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I respect it. And I think being also the way, you know, you're very OCD, things mm -hmm. have to have its own particular lane and yeah. to honor your, your father's legacy of his life. And he's passed away. I think it's hard to kind of like shift that way of thinking. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, you know, um, when it comes to this sort of idea of like competition, you know, uh, it sounds like you have a lot of competitive drive inside of you. Uh, oh, yeah. Where, where does that come from? Is, is it sports in the early days or? It's just, it's just me kind of growing, it's just me growing up and just being in the sports. You know, if you play sports at a young age, you know, you're not out there playing just to fucking play. You play to win, you know? So, you know, I was, I was always, what? I'm five, I'm five ten. So I'm not the tallest, but I'm not the shortest, yeah. but I'm also Asian. So you're playing against everybody that's a lot bigger than you. Um, and it's always going to be like that. So for me, it's a competitive drive from playing sports, from fashion, cars. You know, I was into street racing. And so everything I did, I wanted to win. You know, like you don't wake up, you don't clock in unless you're trying to win. And I'm in the fashion industry. So the fashion industry, especially in where I'm at, which is the urban streetwear market with all the stores, it's competitive as shit. It's like every, there's, you know, I have a denim brand. I was one of the first, uh, I was one of the first streetwear denim brands that, that, that did what we did early 2014. You know, six months, a year later, there's 15, 20, 30 different brands. You go to the trade shows and it's everybody just knocking washes off. You know, I'm overseas and, uh, overseas and I'm finding out that people are bringing, bringing my jeans to emulate our stuff. And it's normal. I'm not mad at that. You know, it's the nature of the beast. And so like while other people, have a chip on their shoulders and talk shit i'm just like all right let's just keep going i have to compete i have to make better stuff i have to produce it differently i mean it is what it is yeah you know this idea of uh making better stuff how do you know your shit's good how do you know like when you design something or you put your mind to a specific product that it's going to turn out and sell i mean i mean i can't take a lot of the credit for it i mean i have a great team you know my business partner who oversees the design and production design and production team with all of our designers. I mean, they're in it, you know, they live it. I mean, from researching, I mean, from researching development, you know, we've traveled the whole world from Japan, Australia, Japan, Australia, Korea, Vietnam, um, let me see Paris, uh, Germany, we've gone all over the place. And what we do most is, you know, we study people's fashion and we study trend forecasts. We study washes, you know, we, we consume our industry as much as possible. You know, we, you know, we, we pay attention to every brand, as many brands as possible, all, all throughout the United, not the United States, all throughout the world, and you know, try to, you know, try to add pieces and added reference pieces that make our brand different. So mm -hmm. that that's the thing. And a lot of the stuff is, a lot of the stuff guys in the industry are just, you know, are just a lot of guys that are older guys with money or what they call garmentos um, that really aren't about it. All they would do is waiting for someone like myself or a, a younger designer and younger designers to make stuff and they just copy it. So, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's my gripe about, you know, where we're at. Yeah. And that seems to always have been, that's a, probably a normal part of a normal aspect of your, your business, right? Yeah. yeah, Ripping yeah. shit off and, and selling it. Yeah. Then they, they, that's, I mean, we're not in the high end business. We're right there. Uh, we're right there. And the, I would call it, it's fa we're fast fashion. Fast you know? fashion. And then we're fast fashion. We're a branded fast fashion brand where, you know, what's hot today, you know, not going to be hot tomorrow. I've seen, I've seen so many of trends in denim, you know, from skinny jeans, biker jeans, tra uh, track pants, um, joggers. Right now it's stack pants and like flares, you know? So you know, I've seen every single trend. And once there's a trend, people just, all people do is just turn it up and just change colorways and just put it in a zillion colors. And so you got to chase trends. You, you sound like you have an R and D team, uh, research yeah. development team. I mean, the R and D team is realistically my business partner and my business partner and I, I mean, he's, I still pay attention to what's out there, you know, whether it's, whether it's upcoming brands, you know, 
hot trends, colorways, washes, hues, um, you know, fabrics, materials. I mean, we do we do a lot. I mean, this is our business. This is what this is what feeds myself, my kids, my family, and my employees. Uh, I recently, my brother, um, he's in business uh, in Vietnam with production, toy production, and plastics, and and does animation. And he has an MBA. And we were talking about when he was in MBA school, he was saying that companies that don't have an R and D arm, every company, no matter how big they get, it's ten years and they're going to fold. Mm -hmm. Because if without the eyes and ears on the streets, uh, figuring out trends and colorways and all this, you won't have a future. You won't have a, a trajectory of success. Hundred percent right. I mean, w without somebody out there saying, "Hey, this is not, this is what's hot. This is this." I mean, you know, <laughs> we've been in business. We've been in business for ten years. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people uh, work with work with me, work for me. You know, the door is open. It's not. I, I wouldn't say it's a revolving door, but the kids that we are working for all have been like have gotten way younger, you know? So, you know, my team now um, is a lot younger. My designers, my creatives, my guys doing content and social. I'm 41, but I have kids here. I have people here working for me that are in their early 20s, mid 20s. That's incredible. Yeah, because yeah. without that young uh, finger on the pulse, it's hard for us older guys like we're getting, you know, a little bit yeah. to pay attention to the details of, of what's selling. Yep. Yep. And I'm sure that goes in 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 the uh, the uh, music game, film game. It's all about this young blood coming in and and really revitalizing the way we see the world. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because at the end of the day, the youth, the youth run the country. You know, like the youth runs the world. I mean, without the youth, there's no next future. I've always believed in that. Like you got to invest in the youth. That's the reason why I'm so adamant about pushing the youth and teaching them at an early age. Because honestly. You know, we get to a certain age where we're old, um, we become dinosaurs. Like sometimes I feel as if I'm washed, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, there's a kid that's looking out at me and it's like, damn, you know, like I want to be where he's at. But at the same time, I want to be able to say that, hey, I influenced you on that side. What's the hardest part about what you do? Huh? What's the hardest part about what you do? Manage. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. What, what, what is it? What is it about management? What is it about managing people that's hard? Um, I mean, you, you have to deal with like a lot of uh, different characters and personalities. And that's like the toughest part. That's like literally the toughest part. Because at the end of the day, everybody's different. You know, we have 30, we have, you know, 30, 40 plus employees. You know, everybody has a different religion. Everybody has a different, you know, people have different beliefs. People, you know, eat different food. People breathe differently. People talk differently. People are from different areas. Not everybody's exactly the same. And so a lot of people grew up differently. So, you know, sometimes there's some people that you could talk to, you know, and and be like that type of coach, like a Phil Jackson, where you kind of sit back and not say anything and let them do their thing. Or sometimes you can be like that coach that's like up in your face telling them, yo, you need to do this and this and that. And people can respond. People responses are different. Yeah. And so being able to um, manage and oversee people, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. What are, what other things are you into other than, you know, the working out and the business? What other um, hobbies are you into? I mean, I've, I've grown up a lot. I mean, I used to be pretty flashy, I would say. I used to be very, very flashy. I was into jewelry. Still love cars. I mean, cars is like my, like, if I could put rims on a toaster, I'd put rims on a toaster. <laughs> but like, I love cars. I mean, I've been into JDM cars all my life. I got into exotics and um, Porsches and stuff like that, too. I've had a pretty big car collection from anywhere from like 10 to 15 cars at one time. Um, you know, now, now, not, now not so much. I mean, um, I still enjoy cars, but I started collecting a bunch of guns, <laughs> collecting a bunch of guns and uh, uh, collecting a bunch of guns, working out, running, buying running shoes, swimming, biking. It's just different. I guess, I guess uh, I would say I'm probably in that midlife crisis now, like watching too much um, uh, Yellowstone, you know? So I'm out here thinking I'm John Dutton. <laughs> And, and why guns? Why now? Man, recently, uh, recently, um, damn, recently, we just had an intruder try to break into my house. Yeah. But uh, even before that, obviously, even before that, I already had a bunch of guns. But because of that, it made me kind of like rethink uh, how I was living, you know, pretty much like, hey, you know, if you're collecting these guns, get really good at using the gun. You know, obviously, I have a family and I know how it works. I was like, I'm the man of the house. I got to protect my family. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, thank God they didn't get in um, and we're safe. Um, but I told myself the same thing is I, I have to I have to do something in case anything happens. And so, you know, me and my buddies, me and my buddies started going to the shooting range, um, started buying a bunch of more different guns and handguns, and just really getting into it. And honestly, it's kind of fun. Yeah. You know, I, I, I listen to you and I can imagine a TV show built around your your lifestyle is that ever on the horizon it's it's uh it's funny you say that um it's in the work can you um, elaborate you know, can you tell us a little bit I about mean, it i know i mean i have you know i mean i've been a i've been approached by a couple of producers um there's a sizzle out there right now um and i mean i don't like to say anything until it's cemented cemented in but yeah there's a, there there's a possibility of a show coming out now, when when you do have a show, or if you do, and when you start pitching to different studios to buy it, what do you think is the selling point of your life? Selling point of my life is just to be a teacher. Like I wouldn't want to do a corny reality show where you're just following me and my, my family and and being like, like, you know, I don't want to say like the Kardashians. What what I would rather do on my show is to teach somebody. So like, like how to start a how would you start a brand, you know? So just to kind of see my over um, um, my uh, my structure because there's a lot of fashion uh, fashion shows out there that you know they have contestants or project one runway, but starting a brand or being a brand owner is more than just making some sketches and producing uh, producing stuff. There's a lot to goes into it. If you want to start a brand, there's a gazillion steps, you know, off the top, you know, you start a brand, what's the first thing you do? Get the trademark, get the handles, get the website, right? From there, what else do you do? The mood boards, the mood boards, the collection, um, start, start, you know, start pitching your whole idea, having delivery dates, having, um, having projections and sampling product, getting margins, getting, I mean, it's just, it's just so much more than just, Hey, this is my idea. I drew something cool. Like, here it is, get it to the world. No, by the time you get, by the time something goes into a store, let's just say you're a store owner and something goes in your store, there's been a whole process of over close to two years of that item going into your store. And so for me, no. it's just more or less like if I were to do a show, it'd be more of like a, a docu-series or a documentary around, you know, how to build a brand. I'd watch that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely watch that because, you know, we have enough Flash and we have enough Kardashian shows out there. Uh, House yeah. of Hoes is cool because it has this sort of uh, human element of, uh, you know, a family. Although they have money, there's still internal struggles with emotions, yeah. and lifestyle and stuff like that. But, yeah, we don't see typically a Vietnamese person in the fashion game with the teaching angle. And I think mm -hmm. that would be very very interesting to watch because it's yep. it's healthy it's it's uh it's um it's well-rounded if you think about it right yeah yeah i mean that's what that's what i'd want it to be yeah it's a, a wholesome show that's the word i'm looking for it's a wholesome show and a lot of drama can be built into the failures of an entrepreneur you bring in a young entrepreneur you bring on under your wing yeah i mean in the, the day i'm i'm at that age where i don't want you to fucking look at my watches and yeah. cars that's it's such a that's so douchey now like now like you know, I lived that. I lived that. In my early thirties, going to going to clubs, popping bottles, and all that stuff. It was great. It was a good time. But you know, I'm I'm at that age where they call me Joe Chris. You know, so I'm not. You know, they call me Joe Chris. So I'm I'm good with that. You know, I I still like to have a good time here and there. But at the same time, you know, I've already had that. That ship has super sailed. Yeah, Chris. Thank you so much, man. I've I've learned a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. you know we've we've spoken in the past, and you know things. You, your answers are very compact, and they they pack a punch when you when you deliver uh, your thoughts. And you know it's, it, we don't have to spend nine hours to talk and and no. get who you are. No, no I, I really enjoyed it too. I think this is better than the last one too, and I hope the audio is better. Yeah, it's great. It's very yeah, good. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my bad with like the, I'm in like the warehouse right now. No, no. It's yeah, great. I'm in the work. I'm literally in the warehouse right now, so that's why you hear the taping and all that other stuff. Oh, that dope! Is... Oh, that's cool. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That was. Oh, thank you for that. That's a. That was a cool uh, display of uh, your your space. No, yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the space the space here the space here is cool. I mean, I, you know what? 
this, this might be different. It'll be the first time you'll ever have a podcast that will give you a tour of the office. Oh, I really appreciate this. This is Yeah, awesome. so this right here is my warehouse right where we kind of have everything. Yeah, so what we're looking at uh, just for the uh, podcast listeners and if it's yeah, not- these, these are just people. Uh, these are a couple of my business partners. Um, Package mortars. You guys are live on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's uh, more of the warehouse side. So this is where like my upstairs right here is my customer service, my logistics. And, so, and this houses all nine brands here? Yeah, yeah. It has, houses all nine brands. All right, hold on. This is going to be the first one. Huh? The podcast oh, got a tour. This, this is, is very CFO, cool. Derek. He's like employee number one. Hey, what's up, Derek? What's up, man? Hey, Derek. Good to see you. Good to meet you. This is very cool. And so let me see. Hold on. Um, So we're walking around Chris's warehouse. He just showed us the office. John. There's another office. You're on the podcast. You're on the... Hey. Yep. All right. So, and so this, this is, this is where our uh, shipping bay was from our Sorry. This is a huge place, guys. How many square feet? How many square feet is it? Yep. Chris, how many square feet is the, the space? Uh, roughly 17,000. Uh, that's a big warehouse. 17,000. I mean, this is probably my, my pride and joy. We bought it. So I own the, I own the warehouse. Wow. And it's so, stacked to the, the roof with, to the yeah, ceiling. This is our loading dock in the back. You see a few containers out here with a forklift. Yeah. So this is only the logistics side. I'm going to walk you over to, uh, the warehouse side, the, we call it like the, what do I call it? like a fantasy factory so this is where our sales marketing team is yeah and so this is where like uh the rest of the squad is so this is more like the uh this is the front end guy so right now you're looking at the back end guys this is the front end guys the guys that make make everything happen yeah it, it, so it's such a special thing to have your own warehouse even if you're renting but the fact that you own it is such a yeah. you know such a special thing big so accomplishment all my employees, this is g my marketing director hey, how are you, sir? hey what's up how you doing pleasure so here it is so Oh, very cool. You got a basketball court inside this property. This is insane, people. Holy shit. Yo, like a half court inside this factory with the painted floors and everything. So up there is my sales team. Yeah. And the mezzanine. And this is how you know I am about my workout. I have a gym here too. Oh shit. The gym is bigger than the basketball court. (laughs) So it's a full it's a full built out gym, treadmill, weights. All that, and hold on. This is my design. This is my design team. Now we're in a different part of the factory. There's uh, samples being made, design teams, computers, desks. Madeline, one of my designers. Hey, Madeline. And this Very is cool. My, this is my showroom with all like the current stuff, but it's kind of messy right now. So hold on a sec. Oh, beautiful! There are racks of clothes everywhere. This is awesome, man. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's, that's essentially it right there. Cool. We'll put this in the video. This is awesome. Yeah. 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 All right, buddy. Cool. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. And hopefully, we can, um, you know, see you soon. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Later, brother. Katie. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Vietnamese with Kenneth Wynn. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Wynn, Catherine Wynn, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcast.